So I would now like to welcome, bang on time, Massimo, uh, our next speaker to the stage, uh, Massimo Pellucci, and <laughs> Massimo is most famous as the, uh, the organizer of last year's Stoicon, obviously, which was in New York, and uh, where Massimo is K.D. Arani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York. Uh, and actually, I'm really delighted to have last year's organizer as our first speaker today. Uh, Massimo has PhDs in genetics, evolutionary biology, and philosophy, and Star Trek? No? Okay. Uh, he's a prolific... That's the next one. That's the next one. He's a prolific blogger and has written or edited 10 books, including How to Be a Stoic, uh, which I'm sure many of you have read or are in the process of reading. And his talk is entitled How to Be a Stoic, Conversations with Epictetus. So we're going to do the exchange. You're great, happy. So, why don't you, can you put it? Up yeah, do you want me to? Yeah. Thank you. We're, we're stoic minimalists, one microphone <laughs> at a time. Uh, so, before we started, uh, Don forgot to tell you because he didn't know it that uh, I'm actually the official Twitter uh, of the conference. So if you want to follow the conference on Twitter, because you're not here, uh, then look for hashtag Stoicon2017. Now, of course, being the official Stoicon Twitter means that I'm not going to be the one featured. So if you forgive me, we're actually going to take a selfie. <laughs> Everybody smiles. This is going to be on Twitter. Not now, however. All right, so what I wanted to do today was to uh, give you an example of these conversations with dictators, which are the way in which I structured the book. Each chapter is a different conversation on different topics. Sometimes I, I agree with Epictetus. In fact, most of the times, sometimes I disagree. Uh, sometimes we have a little bit of back and forth. Uh, this obviously did not happen. This was a thought experiment. Uh, in my mind, no need to call the therapist um, yet. Uh, Today, the, the one I'm presenting today is, I think, arguably the most important chapter in the book, arguably the most important uh, word that, or concept that we have inherited from the ancient Greeks and Romans, and, and something that Stoics probably don't talk enough about, and they should talk about more. And it is about, um, it's, it's one way to explain how Stoicism is a very forgiving and self-forgiving uh, kind of philosophy. Uh, one of the things you don't want to do as Stoics is go around telling other people, bad Stoic, you're not behaving, you know, um, beating them on with the, with the stick um, from, from Epictetus. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to start with a quote from Epictetus who says, uh, for if one shows this, a man will retire from his error of himself, but as long as you do not succeed in showing this, you need not wonder if he persists in his error, for he acts because he has an impression that he is right. The idea here is that everybody thinks they're right, not just philosophers, everybody. And so nobody makes mistakes on purpose. Nobody is, in fact, as we'll see in a minute, evil on purpose. Nobody gets up in the morning, goes in front of the, of the, of the meter and says, whoa, what kind of evil things can I do today? Well, things are, were right, and so if you think that somebody else is wrong, tell them, explain, try to convince them. Uh, if you don't do that, and, or if you fail to do that, uh, it's really not their fault necessarily. They're, they have a failure, but it's not, it's not a failure of evil, it's a failure of ignorance. That concept comes from Socrates, who according to Diogenes Laertius, said there is only one good knowledge and only one evil ignorance. Now the first time I read this years and years ago, I said, what the hell was he talking about? Clearly, there are lots of people who are evil, and they're not ignorant. They even have PhDs, sometimes more, even more than one. So it's like, what's going on there? Clearly, it, it must have meant something else. It couldn't possibly mean ignorance in the sense in which we understand it normally. And sure enough, uh, I asked colleagues who actually read ancient Greeks much better than I do, which is next to nothing. Um, and the idea is that the word knowledge there is actually the Greek word episteme, which indicates understanding in general. So it's more than just knowledge of specific fields. It's a general understanding of things. And more importantly, the word ignorance is not ignorance at all, is amatia, which means lack of wisdom. So evil people are unwise. 
essentially. They're not just ignorant in the sense that they haven't studied or they don't have a college degree or anything like that. In fact, it's got nothing to do with, really with formal education. Let me uh, explain the, the concept in, uh, by uh, reminding you of a little uh, nice dialogue between Socrates on your left and Alcibiades on your right. Alcibiades was a fascinating character. I'm surprised that nobody's written a book about Alcibiades yet. Don't do it because I'm working on it. Um, he was an Athenian general. Uh, he was the, uh, a student, friend, and part-time lover of Socrates, as we find out in the symposium. Uh, an interesting character, but he was a very flawed character. Uh, some, some people blame him from, for the Athenians losing the Peloponnesian War uh, to Sparta. That may or may not be fair, because after all, he, had, he was the one that had the idea of sending the Athenians down to Syracuse. Uh, to turn the war around, that failed, but in part they probably failed because the Athenians are, were fickle and they just withdrew the command from Alcibiades right before the expedition. So whatever. Whatever happened, however, it was a, flaw, a flawed person. There is this, dialogue, this bit of dialogue between the two of them which is illustrative of what I'm talking about here. Socrates says, but if you're bewildered, is it not clear from what has gone before that you are not only ignorant of the greatest things, but while not knowing them, you think that you do? And Alcibiades says, yeah, I'm afraid so. This is a typical Socratic dialogue, right? Where Socrates says something and somebody else says, yep, you're right, Socrates, absolutely. <laughs> I, I didn't think about that. You're absolutely correct. Um, and then Socrates goes on and says, I like Alcibiades for the plight you're in. I shrink indeed from giving it a name, but still, as we're alone, let me speak out. It's not clear I, how could they possibly be alone if somebody wrote that down. But you're wedded to stupidity, my fine friend of the vilest kind. You're impeached of this by your own words out of your own mouth. And this, it seems, is why you dash into politics before you have been educated. And you are not alone in this plight, but you share it with most of those who manage our city's affairs, except just a few and perhaps your guardian, Pericles. Socrates is saying that you, before you go into politics, you should be wise. <laughs> Gee, I wish some people were listening to this thing. Um, now, quick, quick quiz. Which one of these two <laughs> suffers from amatia? I want to know. Raise your hands. How many people the Pericles suffers from amatia? OK. How many people the other guy? Yeah, that's a healthy, healthy number. Yeah, that's right. But see, he's not evil. He's just amaticon. I don't know what, it, what is it, somebody who suffers from amatia. All right, let me tell you another little story, which is also found in Epictetus. By the way, um, as, you, as Don, I think, mentioned, uh, Epictetus actually didn't write anything down, just like Socrates. That was the sport at that time. You know, you teach, but you don't write. Um, and so what we know is from Arian, one of his hopefully best and brightest students, uh, that means that we need to take all of this with a, with a pinch of salt. I mean, if, whenever I think that my legacy might depend on one of my students taking notes in my lecture as I shudder, um, uh, what might come across in the centuries to come. Fortunately, that's not going to be a problem because there is the internet and you write books these days. One of the stories that Epictetus allegedly tells his uh, students is of Medea. Medea, of course, is a famous uh, uh, sort of mythological figure uh, in, in, uh, in ancient Greece. Uh, she, is, um, she has helped Jason, uh, E of the Argonaut, uh, to steal the, fa the fabled golden fleece. In doing that, by the way, uh, she betrayed her father and killed her brother. So it's like she's a shady character from the beginning. So it's not, it's not, she did that for love, however. And that, of course, it's fine. Um, uh, she also did it to escape her barbarian country and come to civilize Greece. I mean, after all, this is a play that is actually written by a Greek, a Greek man. So that makes perfect sense. The story of Medea is often interpreted as, as, as one that has, uh, that is essentially a tale of misogyny and xenophobia, and there is a good reason to make that interpretation. She was a woman, and she was a barbarian, and she ends up pretty badly. On the other hand, uh, more recently, it has actually been interpreted, interestingly, as a proto-feminist story of a woman's struggle in a patriarchal society. And I don't know if it is meant it, meant it that way or not, but it certainly is an interesting reading of the story. Incidentally, Seneca rewrote Medea, and Seneca's Medea is actually much more favorable to the main character uh, than the original story. Uh, so if you, if you read, if you are curious and read the, uh, Seneca, compare Seneca with Euripides and you'll see the differences. 
Okay. Now, Medea eventually is abandoned by Jason because, you know, Jason finds a proper Greek woman to marry. Uh, and in a rage, she kills her own sons, um, her own children, uh, who are also Jason's children because she's desperate and she does it for spite. And she does it very consciously for spite. This is not something that she doesn't know. Euripides, in fact, has Medea say, I know full well what else I mean to do. But passion overpowers what counsel bids me. Right? So she's aware of the atrocities that she's doing, but she just can't help it. She says, that's it, I gotta do it. This is the best thing that I can do at this moment. Notice, therefore, she's not evil. She's just under the spell of passions. She's suffering from amatia. Now, Epictetus makes a number of interesting comments on uh, Medea. He says, here, the very gratification of passion and the vengeance she takes on her husband, she believes to be more to her profit than saving her children. So she has actually done a calculation. She has arrived at a judgment in her head. Now, we all think, presumably, that this is a horrible judgment. This is a horribly mistaken judgment. But it is a judgment nonetheless. She thinks she's right. She thinks that is the least bad course of action she can take. Right? Why then are you indignant with her? Because unhappy woman, she's deluded on the greatest matters and is transformed from a human being into a serpent. Why do you not rather pity her? Uh, if so, it may be. As we pity the blind and the lame, so should we pity those who are blinded and lamed in their most sovereign faculties. Right? So if you see somebody who is blind, you don't go there and mock them or, or criticize them for being blind. You say, oh, you poor thing, let me see if I can help you. And Epictetus is drawing a direct analogy there with, uh, between physical health and uh, sort of the health of the soul, for lack of a better, better word. And he says, we should, try to, we should pity her, first of all, instead of condemning her, and then try to help her if possible. In this sense, uh, this, this, this aspect of uh, Stoic philosophy is, is most definitely a forgiving kind of, of uh, philosophy, and also, as I said, self-forgiving. Self now, one way to look at it is that this is essentially what it is about to talk about the uh, discipline of ascent, one of the three famous disciplines uh, that Epictetus lays out, well, that Arian lays out in the, in the discourses attributed to Epictetus. What is the reason that we ascent to a thing? Because it seems to us that it is so. It is impossible that we shall ascent to that which seems not to be. Why? Because this is the nature of the mind, to agree to what is true and disagree with what is false and withhold judgment on what is doubtful. Even if you're lying, you don't believe the lie. You know what the truth is. In fact, that's what makes you an effective liar. So the idea is that it is impossible for us to willingly believe something that we think is false. It's just not, it's a contradiction. It can't, it's not gonna happen. And Petitus gives you examples. He says, feel now if you can that it is night. It is impossible. Put away the feeling that it is day. It is impossible. When a man ascends then to what is false, know that he had no wish to ascend to the false. For no soul is robbed of the truth with its own consent, as Plato says, but the false seem to him true. So he gets this directly from Plato, which means essentially from Socrates in this, in this case. So there's this notion that people don't, don't say things that they don't believe because they really uh, think that they, are, that they are in fact untrue. They think that they're true. They, they arrive at certain judgment. The judgments obviously may be mistaken, but these mistakes are to be pitied, not to be condemned. Now, modern philosophers have rediscovered uh, this uh, concept, although they have rediscovered it sort of independently. One of them is Anna Arendt, who hit on something very similar when she described um, the Heichmann, when she covered the, the, the Heichmann trial in Jerusalem back in the 60s for the New Yorker. And she talked about the banality of evil. It's a really good film and a good documentary about it. Of course, nothing is as good as reading actually her book. Um, and this is a, uh, from one of the last interviews that Anne Arendt actually um, gave before dying. And I want to thank Amy for translating that for me from the German because I don't speak German. Um, and it says, there is something really outrageous, and the, the German word is, can be also translated to shocking or revolting, about this stupidity. Heichmann was perfectly intelligent. He was not ignorant in the sense of lack of knowledge. But in this respect, he had this sort of stupidity, and again, the word there can translate also as irrationality or senselessness. 
It was this stupidity that was so outrageous, and that was what I actually meant by banality. He was suffering from a very peculiar kind of stupidity. Another philosopher, contemporary philosopher, Glenn Hughes, also in the context of Nazi Germany, talks about intelligent stupidity, which is not an oxymoron. It's just like preferred indifference. Not an oxymoron. There's an explanation for that phrase. Uh, he says, intelligent stupidity is not mental illness, yet it is most lethal. A dangerous disease of the mind that endangers life itself. The danger lies not in an inability to understand, but in a refusal to understand. And any healing or reversal of it will not occur through rational argumentation, though a greater accumulation of, through a, a greater accumulation of data and knowledge, or through experiencing new and different feelings. Instead, intelligent stupidity is a spiritual sickness and in need of a spiritual cure. Let that sink in for a second. So the next time that you see a politician doing something really outrageously evil, think about it this way. He's, he's suffering from intelligent stupidity, and intelligent stupidity is a spiritual sickness. It's not going to be cured by arguments, data, or anything like that. Well, then what is it going to be cured by? Some cases are terminal. <laughs> Most cases are terminal. Um, but there is some hope. So amatia, which I think is the root of this intelligent stupidity or ignorance in the Socratic sense, is the opposite of sophia, which is wisdom. The cure then, therefore, is philosophy, obviously. But I'm not talking about the kind of academic philosophy that so many clever people uh, do engage uh, in modern universities. I'm talking about real philosophy. The philosophy that actually has practical import, the philosophy that changes your life, the philosophy that you practice um, every day. I'm a faculty in a philosophy department. I used to be a chair in a philosophy department, so I had a lot of students coming in and say, can you explain to my father why I'm studying philosophy? Because, you know, <laughs> he doesn't want to pay for the check, uh, for the tuition thing. And so, as, I, as many philosoph professional philosophers do, I did some research. Turns out, actually, there's plenty of good practical reasons to study philosophy. Philosophy is one of the major uh, majors that, that is, um, uh, leads people to a variety of careers. Philosophy majors are well employed 10 years after graduation. They make actually a significant amount of money, blah, blah, blah. There's all this stuff. But that's not the real answer. Right? That's a practical answer. And fine, uh, that is important because you know, we, we do need to make a living. Uh, but the real answer was given actually by Epictetus, who apparently had the same problem 2,000 years ago. Right? <laughs> And here's Epictetus' answer. He says, this is the defense that we must plead with parents who are angered at their children studying philosophy. <laughs> this is true. I didn't make it up. Suppose I'm in error, my father, and ignorant of what is fitting and proper for me. Well, if then this, is, this cannot be taught or learned, why do you reproach me? Right? If this is not something I can learn, then, then it's not my fault. If it can be taught, then teach me. And if you cannot teach me, let me learn from those who say they know. Notice the little clause there. It's, that's smart. You know, who say they know. And that, you know. We don't know that they know, but they say they know. For, for, for what think you? That I fall into evil and fail to do well because I wish to. So philosophy in the broadest sense, in the broadest of a practical guide to wisdom, is in fact uh, learning how to improve yourself as a person, to become a better person, to improve your character through um, in, in stoic terms, the practice of the virtues. And that's how you avoid amatia or you minimize amatia. Everybody suffers from amatia at some level, but some of us more than others. And the reason is because we don't really study philosophy. Even the, the people that actually major in philosophy. You know, one of the things that I tell to my students is that if you come in the philosophy department, don't ask questions to my colleagues like, you know, what is the meaning of life? Because they're going to look at you like, you're like, what? I don't know anything about that. I can tell you about Wittgenstein, but not the meaning of life. Um, then they come to my courses and I say, okay, what we're going to talk about is the meaning of life. <laughs> so let me conclude with what I, I call Epictetus' promise, uh, which is again laid out in the, in the discourses. It says, now, now the things, actually it's in the Enchiridion, now the things within our power are by nature free, unrestricted, unhindered, but those beyond our power are weak, dependent, restricted, and alien. This is the famous dichotomy of control, right? He's just told you the list uh, a minute before this of what things are under your control and which things are not under your control. Remember then that if you attribute freedom to things by nature dependent and take what belongs to others for your own, you'll be hindered, you'll be, you will lament, 
you will be disturbed, you will find fault both with gods and men because you are unwise. You didn't realize one of the basic things in life, that certain things don't belong to you. But if you take for your own only that which is your own and view what belongs to others just as it really is, then no one will ever compel you, no one will restrict you, you will find fault with no one, you will accuse no one, you will do nothing against your will, no one will hurt you, you will not have an enemy, nor will you suffer any harm. This is the promise of studying and really internalizing uh, Stoic philosophy. If you succeed in that, or if you even get closer to that, that's the kind of stuff that you get out of it, which seems to me pretty damn worth the effort. Thanks very much for your attention. <laughs> We're a few minutes for, talk, for a question, yeah. So we have a few minutes. If people have questions or comments, uh, you might need to shout them because, again, as I said, we are minimalist in terms of uh, microphone. Oh, there is one, however, that we could use. We can throw it in the back. Um, or just shout, and then I'll repeat the question or the comment. Yes, over there. Hello? Right. I feel like there are major religions based on choosing to believe things that are preposterous. So how do you explain that? Yeah. So the question is, how do you explain that some religions or adherents to some religions believe, uh, choose to believe things that are preposterous? Uh, that fits actually perfectly well because uh, they they believe that they're true. I mean, I spent nine years in Tennessee. <laughs> buckle, buckle the Bible Belt. And I can tell you that uh, plenty of people that say that they believe in the earth that is 10,000 years old and other scientifically preposterous notions, they really do believe it. Uh, you know, they, it's, it's something that they think they have reasons for. Uh, if you talk to them, you, they're not stupid and they're not ignorant in the normal sense of the term, uh, that you can actually get into a discussion about flood geology, which is an alternative type of geology. Uh, you can get into discussions on, uh, on creationist biology, which is a different kind of biology. Uh, so that actually makes my point. That is, yes, I would agree with you that those people are seriously deluded in terms of major aspects of reality. And I'm not talking about their beliefs in God, because I don't know whether there is a God or not. But certainly, but I do know that the Earth is not 10,000 years old. And I do know that evolution actually does work, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so they are deluded about major chunks of reality, but delusion is not the same as accepting a truth that you, that you know is not truth, uh, right? So it, it's not accepting a notion that you know it's not true. These people don't know that they are, in fact, mistaken. They think that they are right. They have reasons. If you ask them, they can articulate reasons, and they're absolutely convinced that they are on the right side. Uh, and in fact, sure enough, just like Epictetus says, data and arguments aren't going to help them. They're not helping. Uh, I can tell you just an anecdote of what does help. Uh, one of my friends, uh, my own friends in Tennessee, was a creationist, started out in a sort of fundamentalist religious church, and then eventually uh, she sort of outgrew this whole thing and, and, and uh, came to accept geology, evolution, and so on. And so I asked her, how, how did that happen? She said, well, I went to Pepperdine University, which is a fundamentalist college uh, down in the South. And she said, that was still a fundamentalist thing. They were still teaching fundamentalist stuff. But there were people from different denominations. Then I went back home, and my preacher told me to stay away from some of my new friends because, you know, they were going to hell. And she said, why are they going to hell? Well, because they sing in church, and we don't. That made no sense to her. This was not a factual thing. This was not a piece of data. It was just like, what do you mean? What do you mean? These, these people believe exactly the same things that I believe, yet they sing and we don't, so you're telling them that they're going to go for eternal uh, damnation. That was the wedge that started cracking the armor of her belief. Once that wedge was in, then she went straight to the library, started reading about biology, geology, and all that sort of stuff, and three years later, uh, she graduated uh, with a completely different worldview. But uh, just as Epictetus says, she wasn't convinced by arguments. She wasn't convinced by data. She, was she, has, she had an epiphany once she realized that in terms of you know, core beliefs about other people, there was something that was not going on, that was not, that's not right. Yes? Yes.
was there a reformist attitude among the Stoics? So most of the Stoics that I know of that were not actually concerned with social reforms. They were concerned, you know, Stoicism is a personal philosophy. And the idea is that you get to change society from the, you know, bottom up rather than the top down. Although, and uh, Don can tell you this more in detail than I can, I think that Marcus had been involved in a number of reforms uh, when he was emperor and he could actually obviously do it because he was the emperor. <laughs> Uh, although even that within limits, I mean, often people accuse Marcus, for instance, unfairly of what, the, why he didn't abolish slavery, because he would have probably been killed the following day, even if he had wanted to do that sort of stuff. The entire Roman society and, and, and uh, uh, not only culture, but economy, more importantly, uh, you know, was based on that, on that idea. So, yeah, there were some reforms by the people, by the few Stoics who actually had power to implement reforms. I think that Marcus is, is, is one of them for sure. But you're right also, in fact, in the chapter, I go into details in um, uh, comparing a number of modern uh, Western society, uh, you know, uh, legal and justice systems. And the ones that reflect the stoic approach the most are some of those that have been developed by Scandinavian countries in the last few years, where people, you know, where the idea of punishment is set aside, it's this idea of reform. And reform may or may not succeed. Uh, as it turns out, empirically speaking, it actually succeeds in a very high le uh, percentage of cases. The number of, re uh, uh, the, the, the degree of recidivism in, uh, 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 from criminals out of Scandinavian uh, prisons is actually very low compared to the American system, for instance, which is entirely based on punishment uh, and things like that. Um, but it's an empirical issue, obviously. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. But yes, there are mod modern models along those lines. Yes? Could you elaborate on that analysis of Medea? Because at some point you said people were evil, don't know that they're evil, they think that what they're doing is good. But the quote from the play, I think, explicitly said, I know the ill that I do. Right. Yes, that's right. Th that, I put that quote because it ma that makes an important point. That is, uh, what Medea is saying there is that she's conscious that what she's doing is horrible. Right? So she's not pretending that, um, oh, somehow this is fun. You know, this is, a good, this is an acceptable thing. She knows that what she's about to do is horrible. But she also says, but my passions bid me to do so. And a Stoic would say, therefore, that she had arrived at a judgment that all things considered between different kinds of evils that she was weighing, that one was the, the lowest, and that one was the one that she had to go to. So that doesn't mean that the alternative was good. It just was evil number one or evil number two, and she went for that one. She acted on it, so she clearly didn't disagree. She arrived at a judgment. I mean, emotions, for the Stoics, emotions are the result of that kind of emotion, not the proto-passions that uh, uh, Don was talking about. But if you, she actually plotted this thing, right? So if you do something in a, in a, on the spur of the moment, uh, you know, if somebody makes you really angry and you strike them, uh, you have little control over that. Right? That's a proto-passion that is acting. Um, yeah, little or no control over that. But she actually plot, plotted this whole thing very carefully. She first killed Jason's uh, uh, future wife and then plotted very carefully the killing of her children. So that is the kind of, of passion that is not a proto-passion, even in terms of modern cognitive science. This is a cognitive uh, passion. This is something you've thought about it and you have assented to use stoic terminology. And that's why she did it. So in that, that's why I'm saying uh, it's not just that she couldn't help it because she was in the thrall of sort of an instinctive reaction. She actually thought about it, and, and her judgment was, this is the way to go, even though she realized that for most people that would, would have come across as awful. I think we have one minute, so one more question over there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. So we all suffer, you're, you're absolutely right, we all suffer from some degree of intelligence stupidity, some people more than others. I don't think that we should go around with a stupidity meter and, and, you know, and, and measure other people and say, yeah, you are really stupid. Um, uh, this isn't really about that, it's about yourself, right? You should look at yourself in the mirror and say, hey, how, how stupidly intelligent am I really? 
Now, as we all know, and the Stoics appreciated this as a, at an intuitive level, now we know it from con modern cognitive science. People are capable of incredible degrees of rationalization. So you can, it's very easy to imagine some of those political figures, one of those particular uh, political figures in particular that I showed there, going up to the mirror in the morning and say, I'm so smart, <laughs> I'm so good, uh, etc. Um, that's why I think stoic practice cannot be just a matter of you running your own evening diary or just you thinking about stuff and all that. So you have to confront yourself with other people. You have to have a community like this one where you constantly challenge yourself and are challenged by others. There, that's why I think it's important that there are beginning to be local stoic communities around the world. And finally, that's why friendship is so important both for Stoics and for Aristotelians, right? Aristotle famously said that a, a friend of virtue is somebody who can hold the mirror to your soul, meaning somebody can say, you know, you really are being stupid here, uh, and, and you should take that to heart and, and think about it. So it's a, it's a peer review kind of process, if you will. All right, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Massimo Pellucci.